So in this video, we're going to be using the zero product property to help us solve polynomial equations, and we'll specifically be using it with our knowledge of the greatest common factor. So before we use this to solve, let's talk about the property of zero. What we should know about zero so far is any number, which I'm representing by a here, any number times zero is equal to zero. The only way to get a product of zero is for zero to be involved in that multiplication problem. So that's something that we already know about zero. And what the zero product property states is it states that if we have two things, say a times b is equal to zero. What the zero product property is essentially stating is that if we have two things being multiplied and their multiplication is resulting in zero, if that's happening, then a is either equal to zero or b is equal to zero. And that's what's resulting in that multiplication problem being equal to zero. One of them has to be zero, otherwise the equation wouldn't multiply out to be zero. And we're gonna use this to our advantage to help us solve polynomials, understanding how multiplication equaling zero can tell us that either the a value or the b value is equal to zero as well. So in order to use the zero product property, we have to have two things. First, we have to have a product, and product means multiplication. So we need to have a multiplication problem, which is what we have in each of these. We have x plus 7 times, so notice the times is there, 3x minus 1 equals 0. So if we have a multiplication, that's the first requirement for the zero product property. The second requirement is that the product equals 0 itself. So here we can see that we have a product, or a multiplication, that is equal to zero. And if this is taking place, what we know to be true here is that in order for this multiplication problem to result in zero, either this piece, the x plus seven, has to be zero, or this piece needs to be zero. The three x minus one has to be zero because they're being multiplied together and equaling zero. So if one of them is zero, then the whole multiplication problem results in zero. So what we can do to find our possible values for x is we can solve each of these mini equations. Here, we can subtract seven from each side. So we find that x equals negative seven is an option because if we were to put negative seven in here in place of x, this would be zero and it would be zero times something and that would equal zero. Or the other option is we add one to each side here, and divide by three, we have x is equal to one third. And again, if we put one third in here in place of this, this would become one minus one, which would be zero. So we'd have something times zero equals, and it would be zero. So we have two possible answers here for x that can make this equation true. Now, if we take a look at the second example over here, again, we have a product, right? We have three x cubed times x minus four. So there's our product requirement and that equals zero, our zero requirement. So what we can do is we can take each part of this product and we're saying, well, if three x cubed is equal to zero, let's find the x value that makes that true. So we have x cubed equals zero. Now you might be thinking we don't know that, but this is just saying what number to a power would equal zero. The only number that does that is x. So one option is that x equals zero. And if x equals zero, this would be three times zero times something, that would equal zero. And then here, if we solve this one, we have x minus four is equal to zero. So our other option would be that x is equal to four. And if we put a four in here, it'd be four minus four, which would make this part equal to zero, we'd have something times zero and that would equal zero. So we can see for each of these equations, we had two answers. So now let's tie this topic together and use the greatest common factor with the zero product property. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the greatest common factor factoring strategy to essentially set up a product. That's how we set up the multiplication problem. So here we can see that this is currently not a product. There's not a multiplication between things equaling zero. It's addition. But what we can do is we can find the greatest common factor and factor it out in front and turn this into a multiplication problem. So if I look at 12 and 32, and I think about their factors, you have one, two, and four. Their largest factor is four. 
and then they have an x to the first in common. So what I can do is I can rewrite this using the greatest common factor strategy and have the four to the power four times x to the power of one on the outside. 12 divided by four is three, the x's cancel. Then I have plus 32 divided by four is eight. x to the power of two over x to the power of one is just two minus one is x to the power of one, or you can just leave it as x is equal to zero. And in doing this, what I did was I set this up as a product. So the greatest common factor strategy helps me to set something up as a product. Notice I have four times x, and then that multiplied by three plus eight x. So here we can now set each part equal to zero because we know if this part equals zero or if this part equals zero, our multiplication problem will equal zero. So we can divide by four, one option is that x equals 0, and then here we can subtract 3. We have 8x is equal to negative 3, divide by 8. We have x is equal to negative 3 over 8. So those are our two options for x. Now the next problem over here, again, we can find the greatest common factor, which when I look at these, the greatest common factor between them is 3. And then they each have at least two y's in common. So we can factor out 3y squared. Now I also notice that they are both negative. So what I'm going to do is factor out a negative 3y squared to help have less negatives in the problem. So 15, negative 15 divided by negative 3 is 5. And then 3 minus 2 leaves me with y to the first, or just y. Negative 21 over negative 3 is a positive 7. And then the y's cancel. And I now, again, have a multiplication problem. If you look carefully, I have negative 3y squared times 5y plus 7. And that equals 0. So I have a product that equals 0. So now I can set each part, negative 3y squared equal to 0, or 5y plus 7 equal to 0. Here we divide by negative 3. We have y squared equals 0. We know the only number to a power that equals 0 is 0, so one option is y equals 0. And then from here, we can divide by 5, and we have y is equal to negative 7 fifths. So now let's take a look at a slightly more complicated example. So here, we know that we need to have an equal 0 piece and a product piece, and the problem is, I don't have either. I don't have the zero and I don't have a product. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm going to have to rewrite this so that I can get a zero on one side of the equation. So when I look at this problem, what I notice is I'm going to have to move one of those terms. It doesn't matter which, I'm gonna move the 60, but it doesn't matter which term you move. I'm going to subtract 60 y cubed from each side. So I have 12 y to the fourth minus 60 y to the third is equal to zero. And that gives me my zero part of my zero product property. So now that I have the zero part, now I need to turn this into a product, which I know I can do by using the greatest common factor. So when I look at 12 and 60, there are lots of common factors you could use. They have one, two, four, six, 12. They have quite a few numbers. Um, you could also use three. For this problem, I'm going to show you how to use 12 because that's the biggest one. So if we factor out a 12w to the third because the three is the smallest one. So we have 12w to the third, 12 minus, or 12 divided by 12 is one, and then four minus three leaves us with y to the first, or just y, and minus 60 over 12 is five, and then the y to the thirds cancel out. So just by doing some rewriting and using the greatest common factor, we were able to rewrite this so we had it equal to zero for the zero part and then created a product using the greatest common factor. Now from here, we just need to solve our equation by setting each part that's being multiplied. So we have the 12y cubed needs to be set equal to zero and the 1y minus five needs to be set equal to zero. So now we just solve, divide by 12, and then we know here that y equals 0 is one option. Or we add 5, and we have y is equal to 5. Now before I send you off to solve problems on your own, I do want to just touch on the difference between factoring 
and solving. So things to keep in mind if you're being asked to factor is you won't have an equal sign and you'll be asked, being asked to write things into factored form. So you'll be asked to use a factoring strategy to rewrite it. That's what this word factor means. If you're asked to solve, this means you're going to have an equation and you're going to be using a factoring strategy, like you can see right here, to help you ultimately solve and find an answer for those x values that make that equation true.